Good afternoon. Uh, yesterday we had the privilege of having Mary Beth Tinker join us virtually for an in-school field trip for our history classes. The video you're about to see, you're going to hear an amazing story. As a teenager, she protested the Vietnam War and ultimately her, her case went to the Supreme Court. She won her case. It's one of the landmark cases in Supreme Court history. So please enjoy the following presentation that was here at Precipiti Hills High School yesterday. Thank you very much. Good, well, hello everyone. Yes, it's so good to be with all of you speaking with my favorite subject. Well, one of them for sure, the rights of students the rights of young people to have a say about all of the issues that affect your lives. And that's really what this case is about, Tinker versus Des Moines. It's about your right to have a say in the public schools, but the idea of it extends really beyond that to the idea that a society that encourages young people is a stronger society and so it's good for you to do that, but it's, it's also good for the whole society. When you are encouraged to have input with your wonderful ideas and your creativity and, and your energy, and you have a quality that Albert Einstein said is even more important than knowledge. Imagination, yes, you're famous for your imagination, young people. So that's what it's about. Now I'm gonna show you a, shoe, a few photos here. Let's see if I can show you. It's about you having a say, yes, as I said. And not only is that good for you, it's good for your health. I'm a nurse and I spent most of my nursing career with children and teenagers. Yes, I was a trauma nurse and I also worked in the schools and clinics and hospitals. And I, I realized that when you speak up and express yourselves and advocate for your own interests, what would be good for you? That's good for your health. It's good for your physical health your social health, your emotional health, your cycle, all of it. Because health isn't just a physical thing as we know. There's many aspects of health. And when you advocate for your own interests and speak up for yourselves and express all of your feelings, it's also a case about your right to express the full range of emotions, your full range of feelings and ideas. And sometimes some adults don't take easily to the whole range of feelings that you have, but it's important for you to be able to express all of those. And it's also a case about controversy and how to deal with controversy and that we can't just censor controversial discussions or controversial issues. We have to be, we have to be able to talk about those. Can't just sweep them under the rug. Of course, we wanna talk about those with respect for each other and for people that disagree with us. That's also a case about controversy. But yeah, kids, the important role of young people in a society for you yourselves to be thriving and also for the society to thrive. Some people, some adults especially love to say, kids are the future. But I say kids are the present and you are here right now in the present and there's no reason, excuse me, um, why you need to wait for the future to start speaking up and advocating for yourselves and using your rights because without your rights, all of your wonderful potential creativity, ideas, talents, contributions, you can't express those. And then not only are you cheated, but the whole society is cheated. And those rights, especially today, we're talking about the First Amendment. 
But you, we could talk about other rights also. And some of these have also been at the Supreme Court having to do with youth. But today we're talking about the First Amendment and youth rights. The right to free speech, free press, the right to assemble, the right to have your own religion and the government can't tell you what religion you are. That's the free expression clause and the establishment clause. Maybe some of this sounds familiar. And then the right to petition. Now only 2% of Americans can name all of those rights of the First Amendment. So you can check with your family and friends later today about those rights of the First Amendment. Nobody ever thought that these were for kids. And the whole area of children's rights is a human rights issue. It's, a, it's an international human rights issue. The rights of young people to have a say about your lives and not only to weigh in and give your opinion, but then to take action, to set up the world in such a way that it's good for you as youth. And our society isn't set up with youth as the top priority right now. And all you have to do is look at one indicator. It's actually a health indicator. What age group is the most likely to live in poverty in our society? That's you. Yeah, children and teenagers. Too often you're breathing polluted air, drinking polluted water, scrambling for funds for your schools, dealing with the climate emergency, so many issues. So the society is not set up with youth as the top priority. And then actually, if you're associated with youth, you are also not given the highest respect of our society. If you're a preschool teacher, a teacher, even administrators, you're not gonna be getting the big box or you know the highest respect of our society if you associate. So this is a whole issue of, of youth rights. And this case has to do with that. And we could talk about other rights, but today we're talking about the First Amendment. Now, I'll just say a few things and then we can open it up for all of you, but I was growing up, I didn't know about all these rights. I was growing up in Des Moines, Iowa. Well, that's me in the back row with the cute little pigtails in my hair. Yes, yes, uh, second grade. That's in Des Moines, Iowa, but we start, my dad was a minister, Methodist minister, and we became involved with the Quakers also, another religion, you know, they're all about peace, the Quakers, but, I was growing up, my dad was a Methodist minister. First, we lived in Atlantic, Iowa, where the swimming pool in town wouldn't allow black families to swim there. A public swimming pool. This was in 1957, the same year as the Little Rock Nine, a group of very courageous black students in Little Rock, Arkansas, 1957. So this swimming pool anyway, it wouldn't allow black kids to swim there. So some of the kids from our church with my dad, I was five years old, I didn't go with them. They went up to the swimming pool and complained about that. My dad believed that you had to put your values into action. You can't just talk, talk, talk about love and preach about the golden rule on Sunday, you should actually put those ideas into your life every single day. And so they went up to the swimming pool, complained about, well, probably some of the swimming pool, you know, uh, directors said, well, that's too bad. That's the way it's always been. You know how some adults like to say that sort of thing. Life's not fair. Get used to it. Well, I say, don't get used to it. Life should be fair. And those kids didn't get used to it. They kept speaking up and that swimming pool does allow everyone to swim there now. I met some of the lifeguards a while back, but that didn't just happen, that change. It happened because people spoke up and stood up and took action to make their, their actions align with what they say they believe. So that's how I was raised. That's how my parents raised us kids. 
Well, as a result of all that, my dad actually lost his job at the church in Atlantic, Iowa. And we moved to Des Moines, Iowa. And I started kindergarten there. And a few years later, we saw the most amazing kids taking the lead, speaking up, putting their values into action. These were the Birmingham Children's Crusade of 1963. These kids, almost 2,000 Black students that year spoke up and rallied and protested for racial justice. Martin Luther King was already in jail there, giving his writing, his famous letter from Birmingham jail on little pieces of scrap paper that he could find. Yeah, his letter from Birmingham jail. But the kids were like, oh, don't worry about Martin Luther King. We've got you covered. We're going to get out there and we're going to rally and speak up for justice because they were being so discriminated against and so disrespected. Not only could they probably not swim in their swimming pool, they couldn't go to the library. Their schools were underfunded compared to the white kids. You know, parents had lack of job opportunity, education opportunity, all that that we are familiar with. So these kids, they rallied and they sang songs like this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And they sang all their freedom songs. And the police chief, Bull Connor, put German shepherd dogs to attack the kids. Maybe you've seen some of the famous photos of these kids being attacked. Those photos went viral around the world. Oh, the great democracy and how it's treating its little children who dare to try to make that real. That's the power of young people. You see the ideals, you hear all this nice talk about our ideals, oh, freedom, equality, justice. But these young people wanted to make that real. And so they were attacked and they had to build outdoor prisons that year with, the, with barbed wire. And they arrested all the kids, almost 2,000 kids. So much of your rights in public schools builds on the efforts of Black students and also Mexican students too, students of color really, speaking up, especially Black students, speaking up for racial justice. So what happened was the white supremacists there, yes, the white supremacists who think that white people are supreme, they don't always wear hoods and robes like this either. This is the KKK. But sometimes white supremacists just wear jeans and t-shirts. Sometimes they wear suits and ties. Sometimes they wear dresses and skirts. But these people decided we're not putting up with these kids. The children of the Birmingham Children's Crusade did their action in May of 1963. That August, was the March on Washington where Martin Luther King made his famous speech, I have a dream speech. By September, the white supremacists were getting really, really mad about all this. And so they planned a cruel way to punish the Birmingham children. They put a bomb in their headquarters right on Sunday morning, knowing the kids were in church and four little girls were murdered in the Birmingham church bombing. It's called Birmingham Sunday, September 15, 1963. These four little girls, their, their bodies were found in the rubble. Cynthia, Addie Mae, Carol, and Denise. They were about the same ages as me and my sisters. I had just turned 11. These girls were 11 to 14 years old when they were killed for speaking up for democracy. And of course, they're the heroes. The Birmingham Children's Crusade are the heroes of our American story, of our democracy story. And there are now you know, statues to these kids in Birmingham and a whole park is devoted to them. The police chief is not the hero of the story. He's the shame of the nation. But these kids, as young people tend to do, spoke up when they saw something unfair. And we were really sad that September 15th when someone came by our picnic up in Des Moines, Iowa, 
and told us what had happened to the Birmingham children and how four little girls had been murdered. And so we heard a plan put out by James Baldwin, the writer, to wear black armbands all over the country and have memorial services for these little girls. And so that's exactly what we did. That's me in the middle, the black armband. The black armband is a symbol of mourning, of grief, saying that you're sad that someone has died and so we wore the black armbands. That's my sisters over to the right, Bonnie and Hope. And to the left, Linda and Phyllis. And that's the first time we heard about black armbands. It was to mourn for the Birmingham children. But the next year was also an amazing, important time. Well, it was mighty times, just like now. You're living in mighty times also. And that's the times I grew up. And that was called Freedom Summer, the summer of 1964, the year after the Birmingham Children campaign. Freedom Summer, this is students, 700 college students that summer came from all over the country. And this is them training in Ohio. They were going to Mississippi to help register African-American voters but they were determined to be nonviolent. And so that's why they had to train how to stay nonviolent even when they were up against the violence of the white supremacists because they knew they were going to be. They had been threatened and they knew they were gonna be facing violence when they got to Mississippi to help register. Why did they have to help register African-American voters? Because of this reign of terror that was keeping so many, many thousands of people from registering to vote. And this is who call, here is who called them to Mississippi, an amazing hero of our country, Fannie Lou Hamer. She had already been beaten and jailed for trying to register to vote in Ruleville, Mississippi. She was a sharecropper. And over to the right, Ella Baker, another hero of our country, she started a group called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, SNCC, they called it. And these two women and a man named Robert Moses, they, they called these students to Mississippi to help register African-American voters that summer. They trained in Ohio and sang the freedom songs and they went down to Mississippi. They knew they were gonna be in trouble because they were being threatened. If you dare come to Mississippi this year, you won't leave alive. The courage of young people, they went on, they kept going. As soon as they arrived, three of them disappeared. Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner. Everyone knew, they just had a feeling that they would, had been kidnapped and probably murdered by the white supremacists, the Ku Klux Klan, the White Citizens Council. And sure enough, that August 4th, the three young men were found. Well, their bodies were found. They had been murdered for trying to register black voters. So what happened was this fall, that fall, a lot of things happened as a result. That fall, some high school kids in Mississippi, black high school students wore buttons to school. There they are. There's the buttons. It says one man, one vote, SNCC, to protest the murders. And they were told they cannot wear that. No, no, you can't wear those in school. That's just too controversial. No, no. So they started a court case called Burnside versus Byers, which they won two years later at the appeals court. The judges for the appeals court said they should have been allowed to wear those buttons to protest the murders and speak up for voting rights. Why? Because they didn't substantially disrupt school. They didn't substantially disrupt school. 
And that is where the standard comes from that is still in place in your school and in schools all over the country today. It comes from this case, young people joining with black residents in Mississippi to help register African-American voters. And that standard that you can, you have your free speech, right? You can express yourselves, but you can't disrupt school, can't substantially disrupt school with your free speech. When that was, that would later be quoted in the Tinker ruling at the Supreme Court in our case. And then it would cover the whole country. At first, when it was decided in Mississippi, it only covered the states that the appeals court for Mississippi covers. There's several states there, but that's where it comes from. And a few other things that happened as a result. Well, for one thing, my parents went to Mississippi that year and they said, we can't just preach about these things. We have to actually stand with these people. Well, there was a call that went out all over the country when these three were murdered and disappeared to the clergy, please, ministers, rabbis, people in, in uh, you know, mosques, come to Mississippi this summer so these people won't get killed. And so my parents were clergy and they answered the call and they went to Mississippi that summer and they came home on my 12th birthday and told us kids what was happening. Now, some people today say that you shouldn't you, you shouldn't have to learn about these stories. It's too upsetting for you. But my parents believe that it's best to know the truth and that we could handle it. And I believe you can handle it too, because speaking to students all over the country, I hear that students do want to know the truth of our country. Oh yeah, by the way, here's the guys that murdered Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, the three young men. Yeah, this is their trial. They're having a good time. They're laughing. They're chewing tobacco, just waiting for the trial to get get going and, and to come to the to the to the verdict. Nineteen guys were arrested, and this is the sheriff and the deputy sheriff. They were also implicated in the murders. They're waiting for the verdict here. They're not too worried though. They know they could pretty much murder whoever they felt like if they're black or if they're even white people helping to register black people to vote. They, not too much was gonna happen. 19 guys were arrested, nine ended up doing jail time of two to nine years for the murder of these three young men. And you, there's movies you can watch about this. Mississippi burning is, one of them, but it was a very important time and a very important way that young people stood up and sacrificed for our democracy. And at the end of the summer, the Civil Rights Act was passed and President Johnson signed it saying you cannot discriminate in public places like hotels and restaurants. And then in 1965, the Voting Rights Act passed, saying that all these states that had harassed and even killed people for trying to register to vote, from now on, they were gonna have to check with Congress. if They did anything having to do with voting. That was the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But in 2013, by the way, I wanna mention, since you're all interested in government, and the courts, the Supreme Court in 2013 weakened the, v the Voting Rights Act. And the Supreme Court said, hey, if you want a strong Voting Rights Act again, go back to Congress and get them to pass one. So that's what's going on right now. There's two Voting Rights Acts in Congress right now that people are trying to get passed, but they've been meeting a lot of obstacles. But anyway, I wanna tell you something amazing. Well, all of that was pretty amazing when you think about the, the courage of people to try to make our democracy real. But what happened was on the very same day that the bodies of Cheney, Schwerner and Goodman were discovered 
August 4th, 1964. On the very same day, a US Navy ship claimed it was attacked off the coast of Vietnam. And it turns out it wasn't attacked. It was the USS Maddox. And here's an article from the US Naval Institute saying it is clear now that the government officials distorted the facts and deceived the American public about events leading to the full involvement in the Vietnam War. And I was with some Vietnam veterans not too long ago in New Jersey at their amazing center there. And we talked about all this, it's well accepted now. This ship was not attacked. The war was already going on, but it was kind of under the radar and it was just really not, there was, it wasn't as much as what happened after this Tonk, Gulf of Tonkin incident, because within days, the US Congress voted unanimously, almost unanimous, to start sending thousands more troops, more soldiers to Vietnam. And President Johnson signed it, so by Christmas time of that year, here's what we're seeing now on the news. By Christmas of 1965, when I was 13 years old, I was in eighth grade. This is what we're seeing on the news, war, 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 all the time. Kind of the way you all have grown up, really. War in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen. And it was Christmas, yeah, when adults love to send around those little Christmas cards that say peace on earth, yeah. And we were thinking, why don't you adults try it sometime? Try peace on earth. That's, that's young people seeing through hypocrisy. We say, you all, you're not having peace on earth. All we see is war, war, war all the time. So that's how we got the idea to wear black armbands again this time we would wear them to school though. And that's the school board meeting. Well, the principals heard about our plan and made a rule against armbands. And so we went to the school board and tried to change their mind. They would not change their mind. That's me sitting next to my mother and my dad is behind me. He didn't think we should wear the black arm, but, but you see kids are so persuasive. And so we said, dad, look how you taught us to speak up for what we believe in and for peace and love and all those things we learned in church. And so that's how it came to be that five students were suspended for wearing black armbands to school, including me. And that's how we ended up in court because the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, which goes to court more than any organization in the United States. They go to the Supreme Court with cases more often than anybody. And they offered to help us after we were suspended. And so we lost at the district court and we lost at the appeals court. And amazingly, I'll show you, let's see here. Well, the ACLU, first they said, you have to go back to the school board and try to change their mind, but they wouldn't change their mind. So yeah, five of us were suspended. There's Chris Eckhart. He became one of the plaintiffs. It was me, my brother, John and Chris. We lost at the district court. We lost at the appeals court, but now wait. Right around the time we lost at the appeals court over in Mississippi, the students who had protested the murders of Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, the three young men who were helping register African American voters, they won their case. When the appeals court for Mississippi said they should have been allowed to express their, themselves in school as long as they didn't substantially disrupt school, which they had not. So they lost their case. We, won't, we lost our case at the appeals court. They won their case at the appeals court. That's called a circuit split because the appeals courts are also called court. The appeals, the fifth circuit court of appeals was in Mississippi and the eighth circuit court of appeals was in Iowa. So that's called a circuit split. Two parts of the country decide different things about whether kids have rights. 
And so our young lawyer for the ACLU, Dan Johnston, he said, we're gonna appeal this to the Supreme Court and let them decide. So that's how it got to the Supreme Court. And of course I thought, well, they don't take very many cases. They take like 70 cases out of around 10,000 per year that want to be heard there. So I was really surprised they took the case and I was really surprised when we won the case. This is the front page of the New York Times the day we won by seven to two. It was a very strong ruling on what education should be in democracy. It was written by Justice Abe Fortas. And my favorite part of the ruling is the part that says students are persons under our constitution with the rights and responsibilities of persons. And that yes, some things we hear because of free speech, there are things we're gonna hear that are gonna make us uncomfortable. But that's the price we have to pay for democracy. And it says that schools should not be enclaves of totalitarianism. And it has that famous line about how students or teachers do not leave their constitutional right to expression when they enter the schoolhouse gate. So it was a very strong ruling. I had no idea that this case was so important and that it would be quoted thousands of times in other student free speech cases and that we would be talking about it here 50 years later. But that's what the case is about. It's about youth rights. It's about controversy. It's about the wonderful qualities that young people have and that you need to be able to have your rights in order to really live those qualities and, and to be a real part of the society. So now I'm gonna open it up for all of you with your comments or questions or tell me something you're speaking up about. Tell me how you're using your rights or anything you wanna say. First, I've got a round of applause for that story. Okay, buddy. Uh, just first up, I know a lot of you need to ask questions. I, I think it might take a, a while to get the first, but once the first goes, then we'll have a hundred. So all right, okay. Kira, I know you got good questions. Okay, questions, yeah. comments. Yeah, come on, Kira. You can yeah. Hi. Hi. Okay. So I'm Kira. I'm Kira. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Hi, Kira. So I have two questions for you. Okay. So right. my first question is, I know five kids got suspended. Yeah. But how did your other peers and students perceive you, this movement, this idea? Yeah, it was really crazy because the whole thing was really planned at Roosevelt High School across town. And there by people like Ross Peterson, Bruce Clark, Chris Singer, this young woman, but, and there were like 50 kids that were signed up to wear the black armbands. Our message was to mourn for the dead in Vietnam on both sides of the war. And that's what made it controversial. That's one thing, because we were sad about both sides being killed and injured that Christmas. And then the other part of our message was to support a Christmas truce that was proposed by the North Vietnamese and that was being promoted by Senator Robert Kennedy. So we had those two messages and 50 kids in the district. There was a, the district had 18,000 students. 50 kids had signed up to wear the black armbands, but then the principals heard about it through an article that was written for the school paper. And so they called a hasty meeting and made a rule against black armbands, which was really ironic because they allowed kids to wear black armbands if you were sad about like not enough kids showed up for the football game. Oh, that's okay. You can wear a black armband then. Uh, that's why it's a, a youth rights issue. They were, they were trying to say what issue is important to you, but it's up to you to decide what's important to you. So they, yeah, so they were allowing black armbands in other cases, but so anyway, after the principals made that rule, it dropped down to about 10 kids ended up wearing the black armbands and five got suspended. I was the only one at my middle school and I was so nervous and scared. I went off to school and 
my friend Connie was like, you better take off that art because it came out in the, in the newspaper, the Des Moines Register a couple days earlier that the principal had made this rule against armbands. So I was really nervous and scared. And my dad had said, I don't know, you kids should be wearing those black armbands. But we were like, dad, come on. That's how you taught us. That's what you do. So um, I went off to school, I was so nervous. And I, okay, wait a second. I have to tell you something really funny. I got to, most of the kids basically ignored it. Some kids teased me at lunch. Um, I got to my math class, Mr. Moberly, my favorite class. Well, I did like social studies too, but um, I got to math class. Mr. Moberly was waiting there and he's like, Mary Beth, he gave me a pink slip. You have to take this and go down to the office. You're breaking the rule. So I went down there and I was really nervous and I looked around the office and the vice principal said, uh, Mr. Willitson said, Mary Beth, this is against the rules. Now take off that armband. So I looked around the office and I looked at him and I was like, okay, Mr. Willitson, I took off the armband. I was thinking, oh shoot, I'm so glad that's over. I was kind of proud of myself because I had stood up for something I believe in. And they're like, well, you're going to get suspended anyway. So that was what was really strange about the whole thing, because I kind of learned a very important lesson, though, which is like I had that much courage and it totally ran out. And that's what I learned is you don't really need all that much courage. You can just have a little bit and you can still do something. And you probably will be scared and nervous when you speak up about something you care about. But wait, here, I have a question for you now. Oh, is, no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there some issue that you care about that you feel that you are speaking up about or would like to speak up about? Oh. Um, I have to think about it a little bit. Okay, okay. That, that's an honest answer. You, I know you will think, I, as soon as you probably sit down, you'll probably think about five things that you've been already speaking up about. And then I have, I just have one more question for you and then okay, I'll let someone else take the spotlight. Okay, so yeah. this is a more like controversial question that's want your opinion on it. Yeah. What is your opinion on certain schools in certain states banning uh, classic books such as Huckleberry Finn? Well, it's not just those classic books that they're, they're uh, censoring. There's books like um, All Boys Aren't Blue, the memoir of a uh, young non-gender boy named Christopher Johnson, I think his name is. Um, there's so many books that are being banned. Most of them have to do with race or racism or LGBTQ issues. And personally, I think it's terrible. And I think you should uh, have, be able to read books. And there was another court case actually called Pico, which went to the Supreme Court. It had to do with, uh, I think it was Florida was censoring school libraries. And um, yeah, check out the Pico case. But I'm against book banning. Um, there's a group called the Coalition Against Censorship, and it's a really great group, and you can check them out. Also, you know how a lot of states are passing laws to keep teachers and students from talking about controversial things like the don't say gay bill in Florida, et cetera. So you can check out Pen America, like you write with a pen, Pen America. It's a writer's union, and they are tracking all the bills that censored uh, teachers and students in the schools right now that are going on. It's amazing. There's like over 200 bills, I think, right now. Yes, I'm against those myself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I talked to you. Hi, my name's Emma. I had, hey, Emma. I, uh, I had two questions, but you kind of answered one of them already. Um, it was, uh, the question was basically like, what was your biggest like fear, like repercussion of wearing the armband and you kind of said, you kind of described it. So you were like really scared about it. Oh. Well, I mean, the biggest fear, I, I'll, some of it came later. There was different parts of it at different periods. Like I was really afraid. Well, after we did it, some people got really, really mad at us 
because you know how some adults are just like, you kids don't know anything. And why don't you sit down and shut up? You know, that kind of thing. It's because you're, remember, you're a dis disrespected group, of course, youth. So there's always adults like that. And then some adults think they get to decide what's patriotic. So they decided we're unpatriotic. So they started calling us communists, throwing red paint at our house, threatening to bomb our house. Um, this lady called me on the phone and said like, is this Mary Beth? And I said, yes. I mean, I'm in eighth grade, it's Christmas time. We spoke up for peace. She's like, I'm gonna kill you. So there were crazy people like that. Um, that. So that was one kind of fear that I learned to kind of deal with. I mean, I kept remembering though, the amazing Birmingham children and how brave they were. Here's one of the postcards we got. Yes, yeah, very creative uh, and art, it's very artistic. Yeah, that red thing is like saying, you're a communist. I should say, I can show you the other side of it that has our address and everything. But people would call us communists. My mom would always be like, we're not communists, we're actually Methodists. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, so there was that fear part. And then like, I'd say another stage of fear was like, um, well, I was a very fearful child. Uh, but anyway, so was came later when we won. Because then it was like these reporters would want to talk to me and stuff and interview. And I was just like, oh no, I know I'm going to say the wrong thing and I'm too shy. Why don't you go talk to the older kids? So I was thinking all these things, but eventually I, I had to kind of step up especially when I became a nurse and I started to see like, wow, all these kids are getting a raw deal. This isn't right. And, you know, I was a trauma nurse. I was taking care of kids who are shot, kids who are, and then I was like, wow, these kids really do need their rights. I better start encouraging them to speak up for themselves. So there was like that fear of, you know, what am I gonna, how am I gonna use this in my life? Now, what am I going to do with this? You know, to sort of, I want to make a contribution, you know, like we all do. And so you're kind of afraid you might not go the right path or you might mess up or you make a mistake. I made so many mistakes. But wait, Emma, now, uh, now you have to tell me something. Is there some way that, you know, what do you do to deal with fear? Come on, help us out here. How do I deal with fear? <laughs> Here. yeah because like let's say i mean number one thing for free speech i think today is like self-censorship you might be afraid to say something or you know it's like you said people censor themselves i think that i first i'm like terrified at first and then i start to think like <laughs> well, there are other people that support me and then I yeah if I do this, there's other people who would also do this, so I'm not alone in it, and I should just, you know, do it for myself and Aww. for others who don't, can't do it for themselves. So, yeah. That is so great. I love that. That is so great. First terrified, then start getting some support, and remember you're doing it for a reason, others. So is there some specific issue that you're thinking of, or... I think, um, well, a specific issue that I'm like bringing attention to people is I like focus on mental health a lot. Um, I'm good. I'm personally an artist, so I like to present a lot of mental health issues in my art to bring like acknowledgement to it so people start to like understand it a bit more and like can see the actual things that go through people who struggle with it. So oh, I, like I love that. I love that. It's so important. That's why I was saying like health is a lot more than physical health. It's also mental health, emotional health. And it's so important. Like sometimes students have written articles for news, school newspapers and they've been censored by, you know, about mental health issues. And I'm so glad you're speaking up about that. And you're an artist. And I wanna show you, my partner is an artist and we make this coloring book. It's called Color My Rights. It's about all students who speak up about so many different things, whether it's March for Our Lives, or kids speaking up about the circus, being unfair to animals. There's some kids that made a new page for me about Asian hate crimes, but maybe you'd like to make a page for us about mental health issues. 
I don't know. <laughs> all right, all right. You think about it. You think about it. Yeah, it's always so many students around the country are speak are saying that the mental health. I'm so glad that you are because it's been a very stressful time for everybody, especially kids. Thanks a lot, Emma. Okay, so my name is Rudy, and my first question was, how did your parents react to finding out that like you got suspended? Oh yeah, well my parents had a feeling it was going to happen. And my dad was against it, but as I said, we, you know, you kids are so persuasive when you use your persuasion powers, it's pretty amazing. And so my brother and I were like, dad, wait, that's what you told us to, you know, you're our example. And so my, my dad was kind of upset, but my mom, I knew she would understand. Wait, I have to show you the suspension paper too. This is so crazy because I found it in a box a few years ago. And um, yeah, always keep your suspension paper. Yeah, there it is. Mary Beth is being suspended because she was wearing an armband that this board of education ruled against at their meeting this week. So yeah. And I took that suspension paper home. I wasn't sure how my parents were going to react. This is really a family story too, because it's the way I was raised. And my brother was suspended the next day. Even my little sister, Hope, she was in fifth grade and Paul was in second grade and they wore black armbands to their elementary schools. They didn't get suspended though. But they said, we want peace. And Kids do want peace. So yeah, that's what happened. But Reedy, is there something you're speaking up about? No, really. <laughs> okay. You're brought, you're gonna think about it, I bet. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh hello, my name is Manjot. Uh, my question is what would you say to the Supreme Court justices who voted against you? Well, I'd have to say one of them, Hugo Black, he wrote in his opinion that like, this is just going to, all hell is going to break loose basically in all schools around America. There's going to be sit-ins, lions, the kids are going to take over the schools and everything. And it, of course, none of that happened. But I'd just say to him, I guess that, you know, it looks like what you said didn't happen. That's probably what I would say to them. Now, there is a big case. There was a case in June at the Supreme Court. Did you hear about the Mahanoy case on Snapchat? Did not. Okay, so this kid put up a post on Snapchat, Brandy Levy. The case is called Mahanoy versus BL. She posted on Snapchat cursing her cheerleading program. She said F cheerleading, but she used the real word. And she did it outside school. So it went to, it was an ACLU case also. And she won at the district level. She won at the appeals level. And she won at the Supreme Court by eight to one. The only justice that voted against her was Clarence Thomas. And he, everybody knew he was gonna vote against her because he has said that students do not have First Amendment rights in public schools. And he has actually said that Tinker was decided wrongly and that it should be reversed. Yeah, but Brandy Levy's case, um, that was eight to one for, uh, well, she was outside of school, first of all, she wasn't even in school. And a lot of administrators said, you know, we, we don't want the school to have to monitor students 24 hours a day. Yeah, what did you think? Did you, but what do you think about that? Should the school get involved in what you do outside school on social media? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay, okay. Can I quote you on that? Yes. <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Mason. Hi, Mason. Um, so your, uh, your case was in the Warren court. Do you think that had, uh, any sway on the decision that was made? Yes, it had a huge effect who was on the court because people like Thurgood Marshall, one of my heroes, 
he voted for us and he also voted for you students in another in some other important cases like the hazelwood case. there were three supreme court cases around free speech for students after arts bethel versus frazier which the student lost although thurgood marshall voted for the student and in that case it says students cannot have obscenity in school in our case, the Supreme Court said you cannot, you have your free speech rights, but you cannot substantially disrupt school with your rights. And for that, they quoted the Mississippi case. And number two, you cannot step on the rights of others with your free speech, whatever that means. And that's been debated ever since, but that's basically why you can't have certain kinds of hate speech in school or racist speech in school. So, um, then there were three cases after ours that cut back on the rights of students more. There was Bethel versus Frazier, which said, oh, and you also can't have obscene speech in school with your free speech. And then Hazelwood, probably the most damaging case, that said that you cannot, um, if, it's, if it's school sponsored, like a school newspaper, the school has more right to censor you. Although students have led <laughs> But students are speaking up about that and they've passed legislation in 15 states now. New Jersey is the latest state to say, no, actually we're gonna protect our student journalists. And then the last one was the infamous bong hits for Jesus case. Yeah, where the students lost that case too. But um, those are some of the cases that came after ours. But on Mahanoy, it was good that students won that case. Thank you. But thank you. Speaker, we'd like to thank you for being here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And write to me anytime. Tinker tour at Gmail. I'll write you back. And thanks again. That for was fantastic. Me. Thank you so much. Thank our you so our much. Uh, time at school just ended. Uh, that's great. I was so glad to be with all of you. Have a good, safe evening, everybody. But that was thank unbelievable. You. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you're you. great. I appreciate being with you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.